Well, this is our final, final week in our four-part series of Heroes of the Faith. And this last one, of course, is Menno Simons, who is one of two Catholic people that we are sharing about. A few things that, to recap from last week about St. Patrick that Tim shared about. Uh, God does not always take away our troubles, but God can always bring us peace and hope in the midst of life's storms. A second one, there is great power in prayer. It can completely change and revitalize how we think and how we, how we live and how we think and how we love. And finally, the last one, I think this is really fitting for, um, for a minute today. Jesus' way of enemy love and peace is not an easy path, but it is a right path. So we'll begin with Menno Simons. Now, we don't know much about Menno's childhood. In fact, a lot of his history is, is um, especially early history, was not written down, and a lot is assumed. But we do know this, that Menno was born in the year 1496, just four years after Columbus discovered the New World, in a little village called Whitmarsum in the Dutch province of Friesland. So he's from Whitmarsum, Netherlands, and this is one of two windmills that still survive in the, in the town today, which... I don't know if they were built during his time or before, but part of, the, part of the little village. Now, most likely, Menno grew up on a dairy farm. This is uncertain, but it's probable that he did. And he probably spent his time milking cows and doing chores. And like every Dutch person who ever lived, he probably skated down the canals in winter. But where his life begins to fill in is when Menno turns 28 years old and entered the priesthood with the Catholic Church which he was born into. Now, entering the priesthood, Menno began to learn Latin and Greek, and eventually he became mostly fluent in Latin, and later in his life, he would have discussions with other priests in Latin as he went around preaching the Anabaptist vision of Christianity. So it became important to him. Another interesting fact is that Menno did not touch a Bible until his second year of school, because Bibles were not something people had, uh, and his first year of training, they didn't use the Bible. They, they used uh, the church's uh, book. But he would have known large portions of it by then. Uh, Menno Simon's education was probably not very good. In fact, one of his classmates described Menno as a man who had, quote, stupid teachers. And I'm going to get in trouble for using that word uh, at first Mennonite when my kids hear that. <laughs> so sorry to the other kids. <laughs> But Menno did not have very good teachers, and many of the students uh, would run away from the monasteries with, without very good uh, education and judgment. So Menno was a part of this uh, class of education. Uh, and this, this man who is one of Menno's classmates also states that Menno was a rural priest. And in those days, it probably didn't take much to be a rural priest. So Menno, the founder of our faith, um, didn't graduate from a great seminary. But in 1524, at the age of 28, Menno was ordained a priest, and his first parish was near his home village, where he served as a vicar with two colleagues. And according to some things he wrote later during his uh, early years as a priest, he didn't take his duties very serious, and he often joined his fellow priests in, quote, playing cards and drinking. So that's what he was up to in the first few years as a priest. Now, oh, it gets better. <clears throat> this, is, this is a map of Europe about 50 years after the Reformation began. Um, so when Menno was born, this map would have been uh, completely yellow. It was all Catholic. Um, but as Menno is growing up, especially as he's entering his 20s, the landscape began to change. And you can see how Europe is splintering into a number of religious groups Anabaptism isn't listed there. It would have been in small pockets kind of scattered throughout. So Menno was born at a time when the religious landscape of Europe was changing in a, in a really enormous way. And this was causing a lot of violent conflict and war and, of course, uh, persecution. Luther broke from the church in 1520. Uh, Zwingli and the early Anabaptists broke from the church in 1522. This is about the time that Menno is considering the priesthood. And so during this time, there are a lot of uh, preachers going around Europe spreading uh, a different version of the gospel than what was, what was known by the Roman Catholics. 
And so lots of preachers were going out from Martin Luther, from Ulrich Zwingli, from Anabaptists, and spreading their message throughout Europe. And one of them, probably the most influential one, uh, was, a, was a man named Melchior Hoffman. Now, Hoffman was a follower of Martin Luther, but through his travels, especially when he came to Strasbourg, France, he met Anabaptists. And while he was there, he became an Anabaptist and was baptized. And after that, he went up to the Netherlands to begin preaching Anabaptism. And so Hoffman is credited with bringing Anabaptism to the Netherlands. And Menno was most likely influenced by Hoffman uh, through some of the things he was writing. Maybe he even attended some places where Hoffman was preaching. And he began to listen and to consider some other things. Because about that same time, we know that Menno had a faith crisis. While he was administering the Mass, which is the, what we would call communion, but a very different version of that in Catholicism, he began to doubt whether or not the bread and the wine would actually be changed into the flesh and blood of Christ, which was the Catholic belief. At first, he considered these thoughts as the whisperings of Satan in his mind. But he was unable to free himself from these thoughts. He was very, very worried about this. Menno was hearing this Anabaptist vision, but it was also terrifying for him to think that he was losing his faith in the process. And so tormented for about two years by these doubts, Menno finally turned to the Bible and searched it for help on this particular problem. And Menno wrote later, quote, I did not get very far in it before I saw that we had been deceived. In the scriptures, he found a different understanding of the Lord's Supper. He found that the Anabaptist view was the way he interpreted the scriptures, that the Lord's Supper was a symbolic uh, thing to encounter together. But here was the problem. Now Menno was torn, torn between the Bible on one hand and the church on the other hand. Now, thus far in Menno's ministry, he had mostly avoided the Bible because he saw what the Bible did to Martin Luther and Zwingli and all of these other reformers who were leaving the church, and he wanted to stay. So he had avoided the Bible up till this point. And for the question for him then was, which authority in his life would win, the authority of Scripture or the authority of church? And this was a very difficult decision for him. Now, in the meantime... Menno found help by reading certain writings of Martin Luther, who taught that the scriptures should always have first authority in one's life. And gradually for Menno, the scriptures became the authority and also began to show in his sermons as he began to preach more directly from the Bible rather than from the, the roaming, Roman, <laughs> roaming, Roman uh, uh, lectionary that all Catholic priests had. <clears throat> But the problem was he wanted to be loyal to both. And soon Menno became known as an evangelical preacher and began to place the scriptures above the authority of the church. But there was a problem for Menno. He was very weak. And though Menno was slowly but surely becoming an Anabaptist, he was afraid to leave his church, both because it was what he had always known but also because he knew that if he became an Anabaptist, he would experience severe persecution. And even though he was convinced of adult baptism, Menno continued to baptize infants for many years as a priest at his Catholic church. So Menno was convinced of one thing, but he continued to practice another. Menno often saw himself as very timid and weak in faith, and this was a part of his writings as well. But there was another reason Menno did not join the Anabaptists right away, and it was because of a radical leftist group that became known as the Munsterites. And if you know your Mennonite history, the, the experience of Munster is a huge part of, of the Anabaptist story. Now, for a number of reasons that would take way too long to go into, there were a group of Anabaptists who began to take their radical understanding of Scripture to the very extreme. And they founded a kingdom in the city of Münster, what is now Münster, Germany. And when they did this, things got to be really crazy. 
Anabaptists from all over Europe began to flock to the city because it was a safe haven for Anabaptists. There was no persecution there, which was a good thing. But the Anabaptists began to see that their new kingdom here at Munster was the new Jerusalem from the book of Revelation. And because of that, they began to institute Old Testament law in everything they did. <clears throat> and things happened in the city that should have never, ever happened. Really, really bad things because of this. So to make a very long and important story short, and probably the most exciting part, <laughs> exciting part of, of Menno's life, I'm going to skip over most of that. But the Anabaptist experiment at Munster was an absolute disaster and a tragedy. And the Anabaptist movement forever became synonymous with extreme radical thinking and irrationality. You didn't want to be an Anabaptist. You were, you were put in this place where you were an extremist and quite irrational in your thinking. So in essence, the Anabaptist movement lost all of its credibility. But here's what's interesting. Even though Menno Simons was very critical about what was happening at Munster, and even though his first writing was against what was happening in Munster, and even though he considered all of this to be horribly wrong, he was still also very impressed. He was impressed that these Anabaptists, though wrong in what they were doing, were willing to risk their lives for their faith, something that he himself was not willing to do. And so it was during these last days of the rebellion, which was completely crushed and everyone was killed, that Menno had a conversion and a turning point in his life. And Menno later wrote this account about his conversion. And he, he writes this, quote, My heart trembled within me and I prayed to God with sighs and tears that he would give me, a sinner, the gift of his grace and that God would bestow upon me wisdom and spirit and courage so that I might preach his name and holy word in his glory. So upon Menno's conversion to Anabaptism, he was baptized and he left his home and his parish by night in January of 1536. And he would never return to his home as a free man. He was always in hiding from this point on. So at the beginning, Menno began to seek other Anabaptists who had not joined the Munster group, those who had not lost the true vision. And he also began to devote himself to the study of scriptures and also write quite a bit. Now, while Menno was essentially networking and studying and writing in seclusion, he soon became known to the Anabaptists as a very capable and devoted leader. And one day, as the story goes, seven or eight men came to Menno who were of the same mind as him, and they prayerfully requested that Menno would become one of their leaders since they had so few and the scattered Anabaptists needed them, needed him. And they urged Menno to use his gifts that God had given him. So Menno was asked to become the elder or bishop of the Anabaptists in the area. And when this call came to him, Menno was very troubled he realized that he himself was not talented and also that he was weak in nature, he was crippled, and he was weak in spirit. But the delegation of men and Menno Simons agreed to pray about this for an entire season. And when that season was up, they came to Menno and asked him again. And Menno said, he quote, surrendered his soul to the Lord to teach and to baptize and to till the vineyard of the Lord. So Menno began as a leader of the Anabaptists. But as he knew and anticipated, being a leader of the Anabaptists was very difficult. Menno was also a husband and he had three children. He had a son and two younger daughters. And in 1544, Menno wrote this, that he could not find in any country a cabin or a hut in which his poor wife and our little children could be put up safely for a year or even six months. So every six months or a year, Menno and his children and wife had to flee to another place. And he did this for 18 years, every six months at least. But because of this persecution, and because there was actually a hefty reward for Menno, Menno traveled extensively throughout Europe. Now, 
if you were to, uh, oh, cool. Um, so this is a partial map of Europe. For example, here's the Netherlands, here's France, here's Switzerland, here's Germany, here's Poland, okay? These were Anabaptist places and Menno visited almost every one of them, including uh, this area where this church comes from. Um, and so Menno and his preaching was scattered through all of the Anabaptist places in Europe. And many people began to hear his, his words and to follow his ways. A lot of people who were actually martyred for their faith because of what they heard from Menno. It wasn't until he got to the northern part of Germany, and here's kind of the Denmark border, that he was able to find a place where he could live peacefully for several years. And that's actually where he died in the end. So uh, his persecution took him all over kind of the Mennonite world of that day, or the Anabaptist world of that day, sorry. And be, even though he was a very hunted man, he was able to avoid capture, to preach extensively, and to write extensively. Now here's a story, uh, and there are many stories about Menno evading capture, and this is a story that his daughter once related to an early Anabaptist historian. And she said, there was once a man who attended the meetings of the Anabaptists who agreed to betray Menno Simons to the authorities for a certain sum of money. Sounds like a Judas story. So this man pledged himself that he would deliver Menno into their hands or he would forfeit his life. However, this he could not accomplish, for whenever he watched for Menno in the places where the meetings were held, Menno escaped through the providence of God. And there was this one time when the traitor, accompanied by an officer, undertook to find and apprehend him. Menno unexpectedly passed before them in a small boat on the canal. But the traitor kept silent until Menno had passed them some distance and had leaped ashore on the other side. Then the traitor said, Behold, the bird has escaped. The officer was enraged and demanded why he did not speak in time, to which the traitor replied, quote, I could not speak, for my tongue was bound. The magistrates were so angry that the betrayer had to give his head because he let Menno escape. So that's just one of many stories that accompany Menno Simons as he moved place to place and escaped capture. <clears throat> now, during the last years, Menno was crippled, and you can see the crutch there. Um, right there. Menno often assigned his later letters to churches as the crippled one, your brother. So this was very much a part of his life. His wife preceded him in death. Uh, his son preceded him in death. And according to all available information, Menno died at Wustenfeld, Germany, on January 31, 1561, 25 years after he left the Catholic Church. And he was buried in his own garden. That's all we know about, about this. This, was, this is one of the last houses Menno lived in, which is still standing, which is crazy, because that means it's probably 600 years old or so, 500. In the Thirty Years' War, uh, the war destroyed uh, this area, and it's uncertain where Menno is actually buried. But in 1906, a simple stone was erected at the approximate place, which is now known as the Menno Field. So what is Menno's legacy? Well, as Tim already said, we're named after him, which I wasn't going to spend a whole lot of time on. <laughs> but I will a little bit. Menno is significant in the fact that during a time of great upheaval, during a time when the Anabaptist vision was losing itself, Menno was able to keep things together. And he's credited with basically keeping Anabaptism alive, especially in the Netherlands, but also bringing Anabaptism together in places that it had been scattered. Uh, Menno is credited for keeping all of this together and actually uh, increasing the understanding of the Anabaptist vision. Here's the thing about early Anabaptist leaders. Not a lot, of, a lot of them lived very long. Most Anabaptist leaders were killed within two or three years. But Menno lived 25 years after he became an Anabaptist. And many scholars believe that's why we're named Mennonites, because he was able to write more, he was able to preach more, uh, and he was able to travel more 
because he lived so long, whereas most, most leaders were killed very soon after they converted. So Menno plays a big part in, in building up Anabaptism uh, in these areas and keeping everything together at a very difficult time. But the other legacy that Menno has is this, that Menno was a true biblicist in the truest and best meaning of, his, of that word. He had turned away from tradition and became Bible-centered in all his beliefs and practices. Now, once he had turned to the Bible, he took it for the Word of God and made it the cornerstone of all of his work. So if you were to read his writings, you would find that they are filled with Bible quotations. His approach to Bible also differed from other reformers. There was Martin Luther and Zwingli and Calvin, but Menno read the Bible differently. Above all, his approach to the Bible was that it was Christ-centered. Every book and every writing that Menno ever wrote had on the front page uh, this quote from 1 Corinthians 3.11, For other foundation can no man lay than that which is laid in Jesus Christ. So Christ-centeredness marks the very deepest part of Menno's theology and also Mennonite theology. And discipleship, or Christian living, was also emphasized. But Menno believed that we live our lives not in a vacuum, but we live them together as a faith community. And so what that means is that Menno's faith was both Bible-centered and church-centered. And his chief concern was the establishment of the true church. Now think about this when you consider what it means to become a member of Beatrice Mennonite. For Menno to become a member of the church, he had two prerequisites. Number one, that a person demonstrate or show that he or she has been regenerated or that you, are, you have left your old life and are living a new one. That was the first requirement. And the second requirement was that a person be willing to carry one's cross even into suffering. Those were the two requirements by Menno to become a member. And he believed those two were inseparable. Menno held the Anabaptist vision together at a time when it was very difficult, and he built the Anabaptism upon the scriptures. And so, now we'll get to the true scripture for today. 1 Corinthians 3, 10 through 14. According to the grace of God given to me, like a skilled master builder, I laid a foundation, and someone else is building on it. Each builder must choose with care how to build on it, for no one can lay any foundation other than the one that has been laid, and that foundation is in Jesus Christ. Now, if anyone builds on the foundation with gold, silver, precious stones, wood, hay, straw, the work of each builder will become visible, for the day will disclose it, because it will be revealed with fire, and the fire will test what sort of work each has done. And if what has been built on the foundation survives, the builder will receive a reward. And so we consider today the foundation that Menno built upon, and also us, how we continue to build upon that same foundation. And so for a, a following song, we're going to sing a foundation song that is based on 1 Corinthians 3.11, which is how firm a foundation number 567. And uh, I'll lead you in that song, so please turn to that in your hymnal. So we're going to do this bluegrass style because that's the foundation of all music. <laughs> How firm a foundation, ye saints of the Lord, is laid for your faith in his excellent word. What more can he say than to you he has said, to you who for refuge to Jesus have fled? Fear not, I am with thee, O oh, be not dismayed, for I am thy God, and will still give thee aid. I'll strengthen thee, help thee, and cause thee to stand, upheld by my righteous omnipotent hand. When through the deep waters I call thee to go, the rivers of sorrow shall not overflow. Oh, I will 
will be with thee, thy troubles to bless, and sanctify to thee thy deepest distress. When through fiery trials thy pathway shall lie, my grace all sufficient shall be thy supply. The flame shall not hurt thee, I only design thy dross to consume and thy gold to refine. The soul that on Jesus still leans for repose, I will not, I will not desert to its foes. That soul through all hell should endeavor to shake, I'll never, no, never, no, never forsake. Let's pray together. <clears throat> God, we give thanks for the witness of those who have gone before us, uh, Pope Leo the Great and St. Patrick and Mother Teresa and Menno Simons, and others who have been faithful to your word and built their lives upon your foundation, which is in Christ Jesus. And pray that it may be so for this church and for the churches of our community and the churches of the world, that we will continue to see Christ, see the scriptures through him as a foundation and the one who calls us to live in the way that he, he did himself. Pray your blessing and this call be fulfilled in this church and beyond. Amen.